Hello everyone, uh, happy Thursday to all those people that know uh, me on a Thursday, this is my only happy day of the week, um, and more importantly on today's day of the week, as promised, don't worry there's not a sign because what we have got is that person, David Grover, who is on the line as well. Hello. <laughs> um, so for those that don't know, hence the name thing, that's David Grover there. Um, David has less hair than I do, but he also has less weight. So that's the difference. Um, <laughs> in general terms, for, for the people that literally don't know why David is on and, and so on, um, we'll go into the intro stuff when we start editing your photos about versions and stuff. Don't worry about that now. But for um, the purposes of this session, we're going to start off, as we promised, with a cover or with the ability to cover the difference between catalogs and sessions. So David works for Capture One. For, for clarity, I do not work for Capture One. <laughs> um, so even though you keep sending me sometimes support requests and stuff, I keep saying to you, I don't work for Capture One. Um, but David does. Um, that doesn't mean you need to send support requests to him. No, don't uh, send them to me either. <laughs> so you need to send them to support.captureone.com. But David is the person, to be honest, that every now and then when something stumps me, David is the person that I will speak to um, and it will stump him as well. But sometimes um, he actually knows the answer and quite, quite honestly, he knows more um, of the answers than I do. So some days I speak to David more than I actually speak to Vic. Um, and on good days, I don't. So <laughs> there, that's David. Um, so we're going to sort of dive in. Um, so hello to everyone that's on. So we've got some of you still up late. Alan is still up late in Australia, which is a good job because Alan's the person that told me that we got the uh, the timing wrong. So well done, Alan. Um, but we've got people from all over. We've got uh, where are we at? All of Europe, Missoula, uh, Singapore, Australia, uh, Illinois, nice. Arizona, They're up late. New Jersey, yeah, Luxembourg, Norway. Uh, so we've got people up really early and people up really late just to see David Grover. How does that make you feel? Very special. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so um, right. Uh, JD has just made a point saying if we sent the support request to David, could he solve them? Uh, uh, probably not, actually. <laughs> probably not. Um, but we'll see. So let's get started. So first off, uh, we said that we would cover catalogues versus sessions. So before we get yes. into the questions that are sent in, um, we're just going to cover some broad brush stuff. And I'm also going to show people how I manage catalogues and then we'll go into the differences and so on. So in general terms, Capture One has two ways of working with uh, your files. So one of those ways is using catalogs and one of those ways is using sessions. So we won't go into the history of it, but there are two ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. In general terms, a catalog is designed for multi-projects, multi-years as an overview for lots and lots of different images from different places. Your, um, your different life's times. work. Exactly. Yes, yes, yeah. your life's work. Whereas a session was really designed um, from the outset as a sort of a, we're going to do a studio shoot for a couple of hours. This all goes into a session. And for some of those, for that reason, some of the things that the session does is very high, or heavily automated because it's designed for you to very quickly go, good shot, bad shot, good shot, good shot. We'll edit that one. We won't edit that one and so on, and which is why you'll see the terminology like selects and so on. Whereas catalogs is designed for a bit more of a considered approach over time. It's got some better organizational skills. So you've got mm -hmm. folders in there. You've got better um, ways of filtering and stuff like that. Um, however, there are some downsides. So the catalogs are not necessarily linked to the file system. Um, you've got different uh, ways of, of moving files around within the catalog, which will change the file system. But you can have files from all over the place in one catalog, which is a good thing and a bad thing if you're going to move things around outside of Capture One. Mm -hmm. Whereas sessions, they're linked. So your session folder is literally your session folder in your operating system as well. So catalogs, great for larger image libraries. Sessions, better for smaller or, or more compact projects. And I think... David, this is where people get confused because there's this thing about catalogs slow down when they get um, bigger and sessions are faster, but mm -hmm. that's sort of down in part to how the two are used differently. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's not many people going around with sessions with 200,000 pictures in them, for example. Yes. Um, you might end up with a pretty big session if you did like a three day shoot in the studio. Uh, if we just pull out like a fashion example or e-commerce or, or whatever, then yeah. you might end up with a large quantity of photos, but you're never going to hit uh, someone like 
you Paul who shoots well <laughs> did shoot you know on a <laughs> on a weekly weekly basis uh, you're never going to hit that limit so sessions aren't necessarily faster than a catalog there's yeah. you know a whole bunch of other factors that are, are linked to that as well cool yeah. and then final one so one to think about which is catalogs there are two again this really confuses things there are two ways yeah. of working with a catalog so you've got what's called a reference catalog and a native or embedded catalog mm -hmm. if you choose the native catalog where you're storing the images inside the catalog if your catalog gets corrupted you can have problems i've i've had it happen to me whereas in a session because there literally is no um storage of your files within the session it's outside in the file system it mm -hmm. can be easier to recover if it goes wrong there's there's so, two other yeah or one other important distinction about um adjustments so in a catalog adjustments are stored in the centralized database so the capture one catalog um which is the same as any other asset manager raw converter works like lightroom aperture or whatever so the adjustments the metadata um you know the layer mask or all that other kind of stuff is all kind of stored in the centralized database with a session uh, there is no centralized database uh, there is a sidecar file or folder for each file uh, if yeah does. for each for each file so so that's two quite distinct differences as well and again yeah. both have their advantages and disadvantages so with all that said um, and you can probably guess so my way of dealing with the world has always been through catalogs and there is always a debate um, every time mm -hmm. I speak to either someone at phase one someone at capture one someone at wherever it doesn't matter we always have a debate over what's the right way um, with all the pluses and minuses but I can tell you now well, I see a lot of things online about catalogs are impossible to manage. I can't find anything. You know, what do I do with my finals and so on? I don't have any of those problems because I do it this way. So the way that I do it and I'm open and sharing. There we go. It's, it's literally on the screen. You can screen grab it and copy what <laughs> I do. It's not it's not exactly a trade secret. So we have all of our files. Every single time I go on a shoot, I'll create a folder, which is year, month, day. And the reason for that is sorting. So I know in the North American world, we love to put our year, day, month or, or whatever, or the other way around, but year, <laughs> month, day, it makes it easier for sorting things by date yep. with a dash or a hyphen and then the location. And that's just so visually I can see, oh yeah, that was the Iceland one or that was the California one. They get imported as a whole folder into the Capture One catalog, which I create within that folder. So there's a whole catalog per trip. So if I'm on a trip for a week, then I have a big folder with all the RAWs in and the catalog for that trip is also in that folder. They get imported in their current location. So they are referenced files. They're not embedded in the catalog. There's just a reference in the catalog to where the file is, which is in its own folder. I'll then go through for culling and say, right, one is good enough to look again. Two is, oh, yeah, okay, that one's worth having a look to see whether we can edit it three we're really getting there four are the ones that I, I really think are final candidates and then five is the ones that we are definitely going to edit and they are our final images when editing really simple color flag red i'm going to edit this orange i'm actively editing it because sometimes actually we'll edit over two or three days which is a bit weird to think about but we do <laughs> green is it's edited very simple keywords We'll talk about keywords later when we go on to um, the share or screen share with David, but I don't use them. Sorry. Um, I put the things that are important to me in the description. So as I'm importing the files, I'll say Iceland 2020 winter ice blocks, whatever, because um, I can still search on that within Capture One. I don't need keywords to search. I can do it in there. That is all stored on a cloud. A cloud is not a backup. Please, people. <laughs> so if the, it's, actually, uh, it's adobe users yeah, adobe <laughs> users learned this last month to their detriment yeah. unfortunately so the problem with the cloud is your your changes are synchronized everywhere on the cloud so you need another form of backup on top of cloud if you're going to use cloud i use cloud because i want it accessible wherever i am but i also have offline storage and also have nas so that's the catalog per trip on top of that we then create a catalog a separate catalog which is the finals catalog. So everything that was five star, in other words, definitely going forward and green, definitely finished editing, gets exported as a TIFF 
not the raw because I don't need the raw to be exported because that sits in the original catalog it's directly linked out to that output folder on the cloud it's a referenced catalog so there's nothing stored again in that finals catalog the finals catalog is just my ability to be able to sort and find things and it's the master for everything we do in future so when someone says I need a copy of that picture from 2016 in California then I can find it within two seconds and export it if I need to edit something again I go back to the original catalog file for that trip or that shoot and do the edits in there so I have a finals catalog which is only the good stuff and then I have a catalog per trip which is all the stuff that's in between so that sort of does it for me now that's one way of doing it Dave is going to go in a lot more detail about sessions um, in a bit <laughs> but for a lot of people that are asking how do you make catalogs work there isn't necessarily one right answer but that's how I make them work and I have to access my files wherever I am in the world which for the last six months has been the same postcode but <laughs> in general um that's fine so a couple of and questions that, that's with... also a good system sorry to interrupt yeah. that the finals catalog i mean it, i imagine your finals catalog is relatively large but it's yep. nowhere going to be as enormous as storing no. every single raw file that you I, ever I shot on, and, on every trip and it's, yeah. it's funny we always talk about oh you know does it break at 150,000? does it break at 200,000? to be honest mm. the more hardware you throw at capture one the more it's going to store however i break at 200,000 images yeah, like, like, <laughs> it just becomes unmanageable, really, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So uh, a couple of questions. So is this a good time to request a history panel on Capture One? No. Uh, yeah. Next question. <laughs> uh, so figure, figure out where your original files are. Uh, I believe a lot of users think that the original picture, let me just move that there, um, is in the catalog and not the file system. Well, it actually depends, Michael, where you've told it. And we'll cover that mm. in a second, because to some people it is in the catalog. To some people it, it's not, depending on what they did. And they uh, used to be, unfortunately, in earlier versions of Capture One, the default import location was inside, inside catalog. catalog. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, if you didn't I know what that it. meant, then you'd say, well, I've imported my pictures. I can see them in Capture One. Everything's working great, but I don't know where they are. So yeah. fortunately, that's not the case anymore. Um, next one from JD. So I shoot virtually 100% of my images tethered to a session or import directly to a session because I store my images in an external server. Is there a way to organize a catalog to a server? Uh, there is. We'll cover that in a bit, I think. Um, the file references are absolute paths. Yes. So this, to be fair, this is a challenge. <laughs> so file <laughs> references are indeed absolute paths, which I also find annoying. It's one of the reasons why, to be honest, actually, cloud helped me because my absolute path to a cloud is always the same, no matter where I am. Yeah. So that that's a positive. Downside is if I'm working offline, yes, I've got to do some changes to be able to find my files, but we'll cover that in a second. So that's that's covered. Uh, what about Dropbox? Um, says Surge. Dropbox is a good solution. I mean, Dropbox also gives you rollback, which is handy. Mm -hmm. However, Very. the same rule applies. If Dropbox gets blown up um, or its mm -hmm. servers get hacked or whatever else where's your backup not theirs where's your backup that's the, the and, question. and I've also seen some corruption issues and not just related mm -hmm. to um, capture one at all that uh, people are accessing Dropbox from more than one location if they're on location a and they don't let Dropbox sync and then go to yeah. location B and then start you know trying to access the same files yeah then it can, you can get start the to conflict get yeah. Yeah. And yeah, some yeah. of the applications I use, uh, le at least one, maybe two, uh, because the files that um, created by this application are package files, you actually get a warning when uploading to, to Dropbox saying these are not supported uh, mm. if you upload them to Dropbox. So yeah. you do have to be. So for that reason, I can't back up those to Dropbox. So I have my own external backup yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah, the the general rule with backup, and this is even forgetting catalogs and sessions, it doesn't matter. Even if yeah. you even if you're using the nasty dark room, um, whatever whatever it is, where's your backup? That's the one yeah. question to ask yourself. Where is my backup? Not theirs. Where's my backup? Because it's not mm -hmm. their server. Yeah. Um, okay. So what's good is a lot of you sent in a lot of questions. Funnily enough, a lot of the questions were very similar. So what I've done is I've taken a selection of those questions. Um, and we've sort of grouped them. So if your exact wording is not on here, it's because we probably grouped it with something that's very similar. Um, and let's get onto them. So question one, I've imported photos from a card, but not deleted them. I put the card back in the camera and shot some more. Now I just want to import the new ones. How do I do that? Good news. There has always been a button to do that. 
um, <laughs> which is on the left hand side of your import box you have the option to exclude duplicates that's exactly what it does so what will happen just bear in mind it will be a little slower um, because what it's got to do is it's got to look through all the files and then do a little filter to say have I got that one have I got that one and so on and it's not just looking at the file name it's looking at modified dates it's looking at metadata and so on to make sure it's, it's, a duplicate. it's rather extensive which yeah. is uh, a blessing and a curse because you will definitely not get any duplicates it just takes a while to spin through all the scenarios so yes there is um it's there you just put the little tick in the box and what you'll see is the lift on the list on the right hand side your thumbnails when you go to import the new ones um that will start to shrink and it'll actually show you at the top it'll say x number and then filtered and it'll tell you that it's it's reduced um some of them so that's an easy one to start with cool um next one uh, if i decide to move the catalog folder to another drive or rename the catalog and session folder how do i go about updating the file location so Without ruining his thunder, because he's got a lot of thunder, <laughs> uh, David is going to show you something about this in a bit. However, um, the short answer to that exact question, if you have moved the location outside of Capture One, or, for example, we were saying about if you've moved absolute power, so you've gone from a removable hard drive to a, a cloud solution or whatever, all you've got to do on the folders, so this is only going to apply to your catalog because your session um, would, would automatically um, pick up that change, but the, your folders in your catalog, you're going to right click on the folder. What you'll see is just above there, you can just see a little warning triangle above where it says new, um, the one above it. That warning triangle is telling you there are files that have issues in them. You'll get also a green or a red little bar that says online or offline. If you've got mm -hmm. a red bar or a warning triangle, you can right click on the folder and say locate. And that will tell you, they'll ask you to tell Capture One where the folders moved to. Really easy. Um, however, however, David's got a better way of doing it in a minute, which we'll talk about. So <laughs> there we go. Um, so next one, can I move edited images from a session to a reference catalog? And can you uh, change a managed catalog to a reference catalog? So can you change a managed catalog to a reference catalog? The answer is yes. Um, yes. And again, I'll let David show you that so that he's got another toy to show you. <laughs> um, but the other question or the other part of the question, which is, can I move edited images from a session to a reference catalog? So if you need to move the entire session, you can import. It's not actually going to move it from a catalog. You're going to end up with a session and a catalog. So you might want to delete the session afterwards. But in Capture One, literally, you've got file import um, and, and sorry, file import session. So I'll just be correct. Um, so you can bring in the entire session and that session will translate across into a new catalog that you create um, or bring it into and you now have a catalog fine um, however what you can also do if you want to is export particular files from a session pack them as what's called an eip which is basically a catalogs version of a sidecar file i guess that's fair mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, so that EIP basically includes all of the changes and all of the adjustments. That EIP file then you import into the catalog and it comes in with all of the different variants that you've created within the session. So there are a few different ways, but one of the ways um, David will show you properly on his screen. Um, next one. Uh, so my camera shoots raw. I see this quite a lot actually every now and then. So um, my camera shoots raw and JPEG, how do I import only the raws? There are two ways around this. The, in my head, the simplest way is to not import them in the first place and to have control. When you <laughs> import, in the top right-hand corner is a little magnifying glass. Um, and that magnifying glass allows you to type in, or you can either click on it and choose some selection criteria, or the easiest thing. If you've got raw and um, JPEG files in your folder and you know the file name, so if your raw files are ARW or NEF or CR3 or IIQ in, in my case, Type that into the top right, and it will only show you the files that are that file type. And then I can import those alone without any of the JPEGs. The other route is within Capture One, you've also got under View in the menu, you've got Global Filters, and you can tell Capture One to always hide JPEGs or always hide TIFF files or whatever else. Personally, I'd stick with this way because it's done at least on a per import basis. Mm -hmm. Um, just in case you forget that you hid all those things before and think, oh my God, I've lost all my files, <laughs> which can happen. Um, so, uh, next one, how do I convert sessions into a catalog? So again, um, you can import them literally 
um, into a catalog. So um, we'll, we'll go on this in uh, David's screen in a second. Mm -hmm. but I can import a session into a catalog. Um, and then the next question, so if I have a catalog by year, is there still a way for me to see photos from more than one catalog or should I have one big catalog from my folders or photos? It depends is the answer. And it depends on what you mean by should I have one big catalog? Because if should I have one big catalog, if that's 50,000 files, okay, probably fine. If one big catalog means 2 million files, probably not. So can you have a um, catalog of catalogs? Yes, you can. Can you have a catalog of sessions? <laughs> and we'll just cover this up here in a second because we've got the, yeah, should, should we consider putting some sessions into catalogs? They're all linked which to is, the same Which theme. is what I do, yeah. Yeah, so, so effectively a, a catalog of sessions um, mm -hmm. is a concept, it works. Um, but the whole debate over what's best for me depends on your way of working. Um, yeah. And that's, that's the key. It's, it's not, you're not really limited by Capture One. You are limited by hardware sometimes mm -hmm. um, and how fast you want things to be. But in general terms, a catalog of sessions might work. Um, and then I'm going to put on the last very, very complicated question of multi parts <laughs> and how to cross to David on his screen. Um, so in to summarize in general, um, this is about um, how you structure a session and, and the choices that you have for root folders and subfolders and absolute folders and relative to where the, um, where the session mm -hmm. is and so on. So with that said, um, because you're going to see enough of my screen in a minute anyway, we're going to switch to <laughs> David's screen. Uh, which is much more beautiful. Um, we'll just make sure that David's removed anything dodgy from his screen before. Yeah, yep, yep, just hit that. Yeah. Right, oh, what, what's, okay. our, what's our first question? So we are now on David's screen. Yep, we are. Um, so I guess first thing to cover is um, how we do the moving of folders. So moving of folders outside and doing locate versus doing it a different right. way within a catalog, which is probably better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's nothing wrong with the lo locate command in itself. Um, and I'll tell you a situation where you would definitely need to use it. Uh, but generally, it's inefficient to, to do it that way. Um, so if you did want to move a folder from A to B, the best way to do it is just to pick it up and move it to wherever you wish. So within the library area of Capture One, because then it will get physically moved on the system uh, and Capture One will obviously know that you're moving it. And then the, the, the links to the database to the images will all be intact and everything. So the most efficient way is just to do those folder moves in Capture One. Now, if you're thinking, but the folder I want to move it to doesn't exist, then again, the easiest way to do it is to create that folder within Capture One itself. So if I wanted to move some of these shots into a different folder, just within David, I think I can actually right click and say, add folder like so. Um, and then Capture One will actually go to that point. So David Grover, either within your um, Finder or Windows Explorer, I can say new folder, let's just call this Japan or whatever for the sake of it and say create. So now it's made me that Japan folder. And if I say add, that's now going to appear in Capture One itself. So if I wanted to drag anything into that, then if I just shift select those four and move it into Japan, you'll get a warning. If you want that warning to go away, you can say don't show this message again. You can restore it within preferences if you do want the reminder. And now I'm going to say move and then they disappear into that folder. So if you do want to do if you do want to do a move in that respect, then it's way more efficient just to do it all within Capture One. Um, the reason why I said there could be a time when you might want to or you will need to actually use the locate function is if uh, and I've done this three or four times now. Uh, let's say this hard drive, and this is only a small little demo SSD, but my image archive sits on an external drive, which sits in a, like a two bay enclosure, one for data, one, one for backup. Um, now there has been an occasion in the past where the data drive is full up. So I bought a brand new three and a half inch drive, slapped that into the enclosure and then moved all the photos from drive A to drive B so that I've got a lot more space. Uh, and then all you need to do then, of course, is that when Capture One loads up again and it can't find 
uh, all the shots because they've moved to a different larger capacity drive. All you actually need to do is right click on the top folder and hopefully you've kind of organize, organized it something like this. As long as the structure is, is the same is across on the new, yeah. Yeah, which, yeah. which I would uh, yeah. hope it is and you don't have you know files kind of sporadically scattered all over one particular hard drive or whatever then all you need to do is right click and say locate and say these files are now on this hard drive over here and then everything actually links up pretty quickly as well and i must have done that three or four times over the years i would say yeah. with the same catalog so again the, the it's way more thing, efficient to do it i think there's a mistake that people sometimes make which is they think they have to locate every single file so yeah. for example if i when i'm out on the road and if if we don't have decent internet or whatever i work pretty much on a remote ssd the whole time that, yeah. that i'm out there when i come back and i'm back online i'm not going to go through every single photo and say locate yeah. locate locate i just go to the parent folder and even if the parent folder is a different name to what it's going to end up with on the other yeah. um, structure as long Doesn't as all matter. the files are in there and i say locate mm -hmm. It finds everything, so it should be two clicks, and that it's why I, I sort of struggle when people say, "Oh, locating files is a pain." It, I do it all the time, and it's two clicks. Yeah. Um, now, ideally, if it was relative paths rather than absolute paths, that would help, and, and maybe we'll look to the future for that. But yeah. right now, locate works. Um, yeah. The, and the and reason why it's not parents. a relative path is just for performance, really, because then it would always have to be constantly monitoring every single location which could be a bad penalty hit yeah, yeah. Um, there's one question david so a, a session's compatible between the pro and the single manufacturer version can i use a session created with a pro with a nick on one so i think the answer is yep. the session is but the files inside files inside be. might not be yeah. yeah so remember if it's got <laughs> nikon sony and fuji files in in a session which you built in pro then you're not going to see those in in the nikon version yeah yeah um, so Pablo just said, oh, I feel a bit stupid for creating a new catalog from scratch when my old computer goes down. Not necessarily. So yeah, build, rebuilding a catalog, if, if you have an issue and, and maybe that file's been corrupted, rebuild the catalog fine, but you can still just bring everything back in. Um, you yeah. don't have to start from scratch, literally. No, um, and you don't need to do, I've seen horror stories of people doing what I just said. For example, if I go to this SSD, let's just say show in Finder, uh, here's the SSD. So let's suddenly think, oh my God, I've run out of capacity. I need to put this folder somewhere. So they've moved that to a bigger hard drive, which is fine. And then open this catalog and then done file import once again. And then of course you're in a mess because Capture One will tell you these files already exist uh, and won't import them. Um, they do exist, but uh, the fork or the path to where it is, is, is broken. So you don't need to do an import or anything like that. It's just literally parent folder, locate, job done. So, um, and in my experience, that's actually a super reliable action and I've never had any issue with that myself. Yeah, so I mean, hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping because we've, we've heavy, heavily focused so far on a lot of catalog questions. And I think the issue is a lot of people default to catalogs because it's what they're used to in other software, but then there's yep. some quirks with Capture One that catch a few people out. So I think that's why we get more questions on catalogs than we do on sessions. Um, yeah. However, yeah, so we, that's hopefully a lot of the um, catalog questions done. So for the people that still have a question that we haven't already covered, put it into the comments thing and we'll try and um, cover it. But then with that said, let's talk mm -hmm. about sessions because sessions give us some different benefits um, yep. to what catalogs have. Exactly. So here's a session. Uh, let's just go to this was a trip a few years ago. One second. Uh, where are you? There it is. So the session, as we said right in the introduction, is designed as a or was designed, I should say, or is designed to cope with like a single project job slash entity. Um, now, the issues with catalogs and sessions and actually any application is when you try to go outside of what it was designed to do. So if you have a session and think, oh, I'm just going to have a session and I'm going to store 200,000 photos in it, then it was never performance designed to, to cope with that. Uh, so with that being said, that doesn't mean you can only put 50 shots in it. Sessions are used in commercial jobs every single day of high volume shooting for you know fashion portraiture, e-commerce, 
uh, you name it, and location work as well. The reason why I like to use a session is because it's not really dissimilar to what you're doing, Paul, with a catalog per location. I'm just doing a session per mm. location or event, if, if we want to give it that name as well. Um, and the idea of a session is that it has these four standard folders, capture, output, selects, and trash. I don't really personally use the selects folder that much. Um, the capture folder you can subdivide into different folders as you wish. Um, so when I'm shooting or whatever, again, this was a trip, then I just divided the captures up into uh, the different days, for example. And then the output folder is where all the exports go. Uh, and the output, that output folder, which we come to when we're exporting, can also be divided up nicely into other subfolders as well. So hopefully by that short explanation, you can really see it's designed to handle one project task event or whatever. Um, what and I do and then it's a, is that, uh, Don't get me wrong, you, you can name the folders whatever you want, and we'll, we'll cover that in a second, but it is designed yep. for a certain flow which says, you know, I've got all of my content here in, in Capture, I've got then my selects, I've got my trash can, uh, and then I've got my outputs. Exactly. It's, it's a very specific flow, which actually is the similar flow to what everyone uses, but yep. it is quite a rigid structure in that sense. Yeah, so you can see the folder structure here is directly mimicked uh, in the first folder in the library tool, which looks a little bit different to a catalog because you've got shortcuts to the current capture, selects, output, and trash, like so. Um, and then uh, you can use session albums, which can be smart albums or just simple albums like a collection, and then session favorites, which are just quick links to the additional subfolders I've made within the capture folder. So if I go to the 2nd of March, then we see the contents of that. If I go to the 3rd of March, then we see the contents of that. 4th of March, we see the contents of that, and so on. Um, and but it just, is all very much designed to be just that project. And, and just on the, the between the two, because we, I want to be really clear, the, the ability for you to put in metadata or filter by color ratings yep. and, and numbers and whatever is identical. Whether you're using all, catalogs all or sessions makes no yep. difference. Where all the difference comes identical. in is in the, the folder structures and organizational tools. That's where yeah. the, the, the change is. Exactly. So catalogs have a much greater breadth and variation on complexity and options for for organize, organize, organization in terms of virtual organization. So if I just flick back to the catalog a second. Uh, so in terms of virtual organization, if we just kind of open up a few of these and when i say virtual organization uh, meaning that i'm not making any changes to the file system so these are just collections of photos which are derived uh, from the file system itself so if i go into uh, this collection here then i've got a various bunch of different photos which could belong in any of the folders in my catalog so it's just a way of grouping different photos together um, i won't go into massive detail here, but there's also more extensive organized, organizational items. So we can have albums, smart albums, projects, and groups, which all behave in slightly different ways. Whereas if we go back to our session, all we can have is an album or a smart album. So it's much more limited in that respect. But as it wasn't designed to be an archive of 50,000 images, then there's no design purpose to have those extensive organizational things. Cool, cool. What's the uh, um, so next well, a couple of question? Well, a couple of little things. Um, so one from Jeff. Uh, can I have more than one catalog visible in the library panel? So you can. In fact, you can see it uh, if David switches to a catalog basis. You'll see it in mm -hmm. the top left under library. You can choose um, anything that's open. So in mine, I have well twenty odd catalogs um, in that list. However, just be clear, it's it's closing down the current catalog and opening yep. up the other one you, you don't have two active at the, at the same time there are they're considered two completely different objects and, yep. and assets i think um, the best way to think of it um and this is the actual technical name of a catalog or a session is that we call this the document so like in word when you say file open whatever letter to neighbors complaining about big tree or whatever you know it's exactly the same <laughs> In Capture One, you're saying file open, and then you are opening a catalog or you're opening a session. 
So the fact that I can both see uh, my session here in a catalog is because they're two individual different documents. Like in Word, you might have five or six different documents open at the same time. So it's the same thing. So within this catalog here, I'm only looking at the contents or the structure of this particular catalog. Um, so um, actually, spot on. Um, whoever whoever fat fraud is um, was a username. Um, so I was about to say, therefore, <laughs> moving from one to the other isn't actually just as simple as going click and no. and dump. So no. if we just cover with that, how do we? So how do we move from one catalog to another, and then potentially how do we get from a session to a catalog? Well, I think it's also worth bearing in mind that two catalogs can point to the same collection of photos. So let's say if I make a new catalog all of a second. And just call this Paul's session. Oh no, I won't say session because then it will get uh, uh, yeah, Paul. That's, that's uh, a whole different set of photos. Or broadcast or whatever. <laughs> okay, so we've got a new catalog uh, like so. So a brand new empty catalog, another document. So if I say file import, let's just choose a folder on that same SSD. So demonstration images. Let's find Paul's folder not going to import all of them because it would take forever because they're all phase one pictures. Ah, but we could just show a little filter top right oh we could um, so we so... can say global filters always hide or if we type iiq in here then it will just filter to that if i was to type jpeg i don't know if there's any jpegs in this folder no there isn't on jpeg no, so there, there are EIPs, no. for example. Yeah. So, so what, the question about how do I import only certain types of files, right there. It's just top yeah. right, just type it in. Exactly. So let's just grab the first, the top row. So I'm going to say source is Paul Reifer, current location, say import four images. And if we look at this one, Paul Reifer. So this catalog is looking at exactly the same location as we go to Paul's pictures, Paul, 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 Rifer, like so. So we've got two catalogs looking at exactly the same collection of pictures. So just be aware, remember the catalog, a reference catalog, it is looking on your file system and you are deciding what to import into that catalog. But there's no reason why two different catalogs can't look at the same location. And I think that often gets missed. And even like this shot here, which has no adjustments, this could have completely different, you know, set of, let's just open it properly, a uh, completely different set of adjustments to the same shot that is sitting in the other catalog or referenced by the other catalog. So um, it's literally, it's not a case of I can drag from one to the other, but no. I can um, choose the same files out of one across to the other. Exactly, you can reference the same shot yeah. on any other catalog. So and, and really, the way, I was going to say, just just to be clear, the way that you would te or technically then move, if you've got a selection of images that you've made a, a filter of or something like that in your catalog, yep. what you do is you'd effectively select all of those and export. Yes. Um, as originals, pack as EIP, which is the thing that we, we showed up before. Um, so yep. that brings across the file, the raw file, and the actual adjustments. So when you pack it as an EIP, it goes with the adjustment. Put that into some folder somewhere and then you can pull that whole folder into another catalog mm -hmm. so if i just do that set so as export folder so that was file export originals so we've got the four done here eip shots the destination pack as eip export for originals blah 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 if we just go back to the finder and pictures eip shots there's those four eip files which is the raw file and the adjustment so if i pick these up and moved it wherever somewhere else and imported those then they would come in with the uh with all their changes as yeah. well yeah 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 um so one uh where are we uh jd's just said he's cancelled a zoom call so i could watch the remainder of this um if the <laughs> zoom call was a pub quiz that's fine if it's work ooh. Mm, um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Deepak just said, Jens, can I copy a reference catalog from my desktop and work on it on my laptop and sync it back? The raw yes. files are on my desktop drive. So, yeah. Yeah, you can. So, if I, so this catalog here, Capture 120, actually, where is it? Uh, do, 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 pictures. So, actually, this catalog here, Capture 120, is actually copied from 
this catalog. So here's a bunch of catalogs. So if I just do that again, let's grab, well, let's open this catalog. I've got no idea what's on here, so that's dangerous. So let's see what's actually in this catalog. So there's some old stuff of mine, you can see. So if I again right click on it, we can see that this catalog is sitting on Travel SSD. So let's close it for a minute. Say not now. Uh, how big is it? Is this going to take forever? Two gig. No, that's fine. So if I grab this catalog and just throw it into the pictures folder, like so, shared copy relatively quickly. Yep. Five Actually, seconds. What, what you just did there, David, just I just thought a lot of people won't know you can do that. So if you right click on a catalog name at the top, it'll yeah, actually give it you the, you the, the whole path of exactly yeah. where that catalog is. Um, so if handy. you're trying to find it, um, that that's where. Um, yep. Sometimes because it's divorced from the folder structure, you can get a bit confused as to where actually the catalog physically is sit. Exactly. Absolutely. So now Capture 111 catalog is sitting in my pictures folder. Double click to open and away it goes. So if I did some stuff to this or whatever, edited some pictures and so on and so forth, all you could do then once I close it, say not now, you could then just copy it back to here. If I wanted to. Now, there's not like a synchronization. It would just say, do you want to? Um, same file exists. Do you want to replace it? Whatever. So if I said replace, then it's just going to do that back. So now, if that catalog was enormous, that would be, you'd have to yeah. be patient enough to wait for it to copy them back and forth. But there's actually nothing wrong with that. That's actually what I do on a weekly basis. So when I'm doing online stuff or whatever, my master catalog of all the demo stuff sits on this little external hard drive. I copy it across to pictures. As you can see, it already is is there. Um, oops, don't import yeah, the catalog into the itself. <laughs> um, to pictures. So it means in a session, this catalog gets, you know, pictures get adjusted, things get moved around, gets kind of messed up. So then I just delete it, it and yeah. then the next week I'm back to square one again. So, and there's yeah. no performance deficit with that. Um, it's probably actually a millisecond faster than working off the uh, hard drive itself. But this way, this master catalog always remains fresh. Yeah, it's, the original template but there's, was such. it's the original template, but there's yeah. no reason why you as a person can't move your catalog around to various different places and open it and work on it, which is kind of what you're doing, Paul, with your yeah. trip catalog, because yeah. I imagine when you get back to um, yeah, base, it all shifts. you shift it from yeah. laptop to desktop and then just yeah. carry on from there. Yeah. yeah. Do you have um, to do a locate when you do that? Yeah, you do. It? you do. You do. But, yeah. but this is the, the, the beauty of it is because the folder structure that I have, so I have day one, day two, day three, blah, 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 in my catalog, but the actual yeah. the actual yeah. raw files are all just in one big bucket, which is that trip. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons why catalogs for me works because as I bring that all across, all I've got to do is locate the bucket effectively the top and say yeah. this is where all the files are, and all of the yeah. other stuff that goes on within my catalog is now correct. It's 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 exactly. organised and, exactly. and so on. Yeah. Um, before we go on, I want to make sure we cover the um, session import and um, export. Mm -hmm options with token tokens is key as well potentially um, yeah. with that but one question from Jerry so I'm used to being able to find a dated folder and see the photos how do I do that in capture one and I'm thinking a smart album so the, the difference is Jerry when you import a file in a catalog for example um, it will always come in based on the, the a lot of people complain but the recent exports um, option the, oh, sorry recent imports option at the top and you'll have yeah. a dated list of when you imported something but that's not the same as the date that the image was taken. No. So it will give you no, when you imported it, but that's not the same thing. So if you want a set of folders based on when the image was taken, take it away, David. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll see if you're importing Jerry by folder with date, then in the folders area, you're gonna see all your different dated folders. Now, if there's only 10 of those, you could locate it fairly quickly, I would imagine. If there's a lot of those dated folders, uh, the other thing you can do, of course, don't forget that because you have a catalog, everything is, um, you know, date is one of those metadata items which just exists in every photo. So if, if I go to the date filter here, then you've got all the years of, whoops, all the years of 
uh, various photos that exist in the catalogue. So we can see in 2019, five and pictures the date were taken. captured, not the date imported. Which is the key. Exactly. And if I go to all images, then those numbers are going to update because there's more of those. So now we can see we've got, you know, greater figures going on on the right hand side, 500, 880, 2450, and so on. So Jerry, if you know you want a folder of shots from 2018, if you go to 2018, you can see all the various different collections. And let's say if we went to uh, January, for example, if you want to know, oh, when did Paul happen to shoot yes. this? If I right click and say, show in library, like so, Capture One will take me straight to that folder as yeah. well. But you're so the, answer, the, I was gonna say the short answer to Jerry is it's is, always been look, there. It's, yeah, it's always there. So you don't <laughs> it's have just to. On the date. Probably what you'll find, Jerry, is that the folders tool is collapsed and you can't see. Hang on, let's just collapse that as well. But even, even if you didn't have them organized into folder within a catalog, you can always go to that date um, section on the left hand side. Yeah, exactly. And, and just sort and filter like that. So if, if, the, yeah. if the question, Jerry, was how do I organize things by date? Because um, I've got a big mass of files, exactly yeah. as you just saw. So just scroll down to the bottom, mm -hmm. you've got the date filters. Exactly. Um, so on that note, um, just quickly, I just want to go back to, because it was, it was this set of lots of, <laughs> lots of questions. I can't um, get about stuff where how, I, want I can't it. get stuff where I want it. And I don't understand, yeah. uh, where the root folder is and where the sub root folder or sub folder is and so on. So let's cover that. So this is specifically for sessions. Um, so it was specifically catalogs. a session question. Yeah. Okay. So let's just close the catalog for a second. So here is a session. Um, and if we just right click and go back to the where it is. Um, so this is how my session is organized. I had different subfolders which had different shots from different days uh, and so forth. Uh, currently the output folder is empty. Now if you do nothing to your session and leave everything by default, then what you'll see is that the output location here is set to output. So any kind of export I do, so if I just grab this shot as an example and say I want a 8-bit tip of that and I don't touch anything whatsoever and I say process, then straight away you can see the process bar pop up uh, and then the file pops in there. So that is the default behavior. If we don't do any kind of clever, funky stuff, everything by default will go to that output folder. Now, if you find it's going to a different output folder of a different session or somewhere completely wacky and you can't get back to that default behavior, the easiest thing to do is go to output location and say reset tool. And then that will reset it to the output folder of the current session. So if I now switch to a different session, it would go to the output folder of that session. It won't be still tied to this one. Um, <clears throat> generally, you kind of, in terms of a session, you want to leave this mm. section alone, generally. I mean, there's no, if, if yeah. you're kind of smart in the way and you those, set up. Those folder names are, are coming from, effectively, when you create a new session, you get the option yeah. um, of what you want to call them. So if you do want it called something other than output or whatever, um, you want to call it finals or whatever. Exactly. Then, so if I say yeah. new session, if you don't want the output folder code to be called output, you could call it dogs, cats, final, whatever. Yeah, yep. exactly. I just tend to leave it as the default because then the terminology kind of yeah, matches in, in Capture One. It's just, just kind of more intuitive. Then. Um, now, if you want to go kind of above and beyond that, then you've got a couple of additional options that you can play around with. Um, and again, as much as you can do to automate this, the easier and faster it's going to be. Because what you don't want to be doing and shouldn't be doing is constantly going into this destination folder and choosing a different destination and mucking around with it and so on. Because if you're using sessions properly, you want everything to be able to be picked up into this master folder and bring everything with it. So like you, Paul, when you get back from your location and move your catalog folder from your laptop to your master machine, I grab my session folder and copy it across like so, and everything. 
comes with it. And I was going to say, and the advantage you get with sessions is that extra step I have to do about where are my files now. Yeah. David doesn't, doesn't have to because he's just literally picked it up. Um, exactly. And it, and it knows where it's it is. all relative to the the session itself. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, if you want to be a bit fancier than that, so let's just strip those out for a second. Uh, if you want to be a bit fancier than that, then what you can do in the output location tool, we get to this one in a second, in the output location tool, you can ask Capture One to create a subfolder. Now, again, you could type something in here if you wanted to, and Capture One would make that folder. But a more intelligent way is to uh, use what we call a token to automate the creation of that folder. So if we click on this square box here with three dots, this brings you up a mind-boggling, baffling list of and potential tokens. Just to be clear with tokens, David, you can also use tokens on catalog output as well as... Yes, yeah. So this output. is not unique to sessions. So if we pick out a simple one, which all of you would probably use, is recipe name. So the name of the recipe that was used. So if I drag and drop it up there and say OK, essentially what we're asking Capture One to do is... Uh, in this subfolder, I would like to have, um, sorry, in my output folder, I'd like to have a subfolder which uses the same name as the recipe, which is this one. So now if we hit process again, uh, now we've got TIFF, Adobe, blah, so blah, if blah. You, if you had exactly. a, a recipe that was called website watermarked, website um, upload exactly. or social so upload. So now if I go for JPEG, Instagram optimize as well, so we've got two running. Let's just delete, empty out the output folder, and we say process again. I'm going to get my TIFF folder, and in a second, I'm going to get my JPEG folder like so. So that's just a really simple thing, and, and it's what I do all the time when I'm using sessions uh, because I have a couple of others like Instagram. Uh, if I go on holiday ever again, um, then I export to specific dimensions for a postcard, service that I use, uh, and then that's dropped. And then that recipe would be called, oops, I hit process again, not plus. So if I make another recipe, that would be called touch note postcards, which would go to a specific uh, uh, size again. And if I just turn that off and then I say process, then I would have a folder of all my touch note postcards and so on. So um, just little things like that can definitely help because yeah. if you don't use the recipe name, and then we were using three different recipes and I say, let's delete those. And I say process again, we end up with this mess, which is the same file name with yeah. just different extensions. And then we've actually got an appended one in a TIFF because Capture One doesn't want to overwrite anything. So how do I know which one is the, um, you know, big TIFF, which one is the small TIFF, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that's kind of a sub-optimal situation. Let's just get rid of that um, guy for the minute. I was say, and Serge has just asked on that, so can you create custom tokens? I, so you don't no. necessarily need to <laughs> do No is the answer. Um, yeah. But but actually, two things. One, I would challenge you to find something that you can't find the token for in Capture One. It's got more than you would ever imagine. But two, yeah. if you mean by that, can I build up a structure out of yes. tokens? So, for instance, tokens. you know, can I have year dash Paul dash exactly. David dash session? Yes, you can. So you can put static text with tokens and whatever. But yeah. the the list is is horrifying. It's so big. It is. I mean, yeah. yeah. So it's every metadata term, a whole bunch of location stuff, a whole bunch of where you can see here date and time, and the rest is all metadata and you can chain different tokens together so you can have a whole collection of tokens as you can see you can put freehand text or dot dashes in between them uh, so you can really build it up as you want and another little yeah. kind of nerdy trick is if we did uh, let's just do recipe name if you do a forward slash then what you're asked mm. is for capture one to folder. make another subfolder underneath that so if I did recipe name and rating, so star rating, or let's do color tag, uh, did, 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 color tag, like so, and then we processed uh, this one again. Then we'd have TIFF, green, and then the shop, mm. and then we've got JPEG, green, and then yeah. the shop. So the, the sky's the limit, really. Cool. Um, but uh, as you said, there's a horrifying list of 
uh, tokens. I challenge anyone to find a token that um, would be useful. Uh, the question that often comes up, is there a token for keyword? The answer is no, because what if you had 30 keywords on a shop? Which one would we use? How could you yeah. use all of them? So it's just, it's really technically not possible. But there is one for description. So if you put your keywords in the description. In you description, don't. then you'd have yep, an enormous <laughs> uh, enormous file name. Um, um, what I think of it in watermarks, you can also use a token in the watermarks too. So if you mm -hmm. want your watermarks to be unique, if I type in here uh, image name, then you can watermark the image name onto the image itself as well. So That's you'll really find handy. tokens popping up all over the place. Cool. Um, um, now, output naming, of course, then there's also the ability to add tokens there as well, which probably leads us to what the heck does all this mean yes. as well. Yeah, I was going to say, and then I've got after that, we've probably got three <laughs> questions and then we'll let David go and we'll do a couple of edits as well. We're a bit longer than half an hour, right? We are. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good stuff. Um, sorry, so what was the next part? It was this. So you um, file outputs, yeah. 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 So right now, everything you've seen is, uh, I refer to this as, if you like, the global location for any recipe. So any of these recipes right now, I think, because I haven't changed anything, all of these recipes will use this global output location. So the one here. Because if you look at any of these recipes, if I go to... And note, as I go through these different recipes, you can see this changes. So the settings here are unique for each recipe. So right now, if we look in the file tab, we see capture one. The first thing it does is looks at what's in this item here. So it's saying go to the output location that will tell you where to put the file. And the destination is output. And if you're not sure where that is, if you click the little arrow, then it shows you exactly where that is in the Finder or Windows Explorer. So it's just simply follow the treasure trail, if you like. So in this recipe, the root folder is the output location, which means the output location tool, and the destination is output, which is, again, by default, is the output folder of our session. So you're just following the path of where everything goes. Now, if you want a recipe which has its own unique location, um, so, for example, with um, just to use my postcard analogy again, is that um, there's I have an app on the phone where you can order the postcards and everything. Uh, so what I do for touch note, if I make a new recipe and we call this touch touch note postcard postcrad like so this has a super specific image dimension which i can't remember off the top of my head but let's say for argument um it is in pixels whatever 1500 by 800 then it's set up specifically for that i also what i do is that i make an extra variant which i can crop to uh, the same dimension so a little handy tip if you want to crop to the dimensions of your process recipe in the crop tool you can say output and whatever we're selected here as soon as i touch yeah. this boom it then snaps to those dimensions so that's a, yeah, a lot of people get confused with um so the cropping, so the crop tool obviously has original and has unconstrained. The output yeah. one, people don't know actually what it's referencing. What it's referencing is whatever recipe you have set. So if you don't have a recipe set, it's going to be the same as your crop that you've done. If you do have a recipe set, it's going to force it to the output that you've got ticked. Yeah, um, this one in that so recipe section. Touch note postcard. So you see they're both green. If I went to um, A3 print, as soon as I touch this. If I, oh, what's it set to? Oh, because some idiot called David yeah, has too. messed around with it. I can't remember what a uh, A3 print is. You must know, Paul. What is it? 400 and... Depends what DPI. 41 oh, by... Oh, well, it's 420. So in centimetres, 420 by 29.6. No, 29.7, sorry. 420, no, 42 centimetres. 42 by 29.7. 29.7, like yeah. so. So you see this one's gone red because it doesn't match this particular recipe, as soon as I touch the crop, it'll snap to that. If we go back to touch note, notice this one is red because it's not the right proportions. As soon as I touch it, they're now green and then it's always scaling 
to those points. Anyway, that was a bit of a digression, sorry. Um, so if we go to the file tab, now I don't want this to go to uh, the output destination. I want this to end up on my phone. So I'm gonna change the folder here and then it's gonna go to my uh, theoretical Dropbox because Dropbox isn't installed on this yeah. account. So this is Dropbox in inverted commas, like so. And then I'm gonna say the subfolder is gonna be touch note, like so. So it's always gonna make that. Um, and then we can actually do a sneaky thing, which brings us to uh, the subname, like so. So what subname does is activate another token, which you could use if you wish. So if I type in here, uh, postcard or whatever, then I can, then anywhere I use the subname token, it's gonna pop postcard into that particular field. So let's uncheck those. Um, and then output now is ignored because this recipe is going to circumvent I was say, it. Yeah, so in, in the hierarchy, yeah. if you have a process recipe output set in that file tab, that will override what you have exactly. in your output location. And now if it's going to go to the box. It'll go to the exactly. default. So if I click this little arrow, that takes me straight to my theoretical Dropbox. Now, when it comes to output naming, what I can do, so we've got format image name. And again, to avoid having the same image name uh, repeated throughout your exports and not knowing, is this the big JPEG? Is this the little JPEG? Is the TIFF that I want printed? Is it the TIFF that uh, needs to be you know, archived or whatever? So under format, if I start typing sub, you'll see subname pop up. So I can click that, just hit enter. And then now you see my name is gonna have postcard attached on the end of it. Now, as that looks a bit messy, I'm just gonna put a little hyphen in between. So now we're gonna get a unique name for this particular um, recipe. Now you could ask, well, why don't you just write postcard next to it? Because then I have to change it for every single recipe. So yeah. if I was super smart, I can just automate I can do a new sub name for whatever recipe that I want. So if we go to our Dropbox folder and we hit, uh, just check I haven't screwed anything else up. Uh, if we go and hit process, now I've got touch note because I've got recipe name here. And then I've got the file name and the postcard. Now, if you're wondering how did it use the recipe name, because it will actually still look to the output location Oh no, because I put, sorry, I put subfolder here. In there subfolder, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so subfolder touch note, subname postcard. So Capturon says, okay, this has to be the root folder Dropbox. Uh, I need to use the subname postcard. So if that subname is going to be used anywhere, I know that it should be called postcard. And I've made a subfolder called touch note, which is made here. So when it comes to image naming, Capture One thinks, okay, it's got to be the image name, which is this. And I need to use the sub name as well for that recipe. So Capture One looks back up here and now has postcard like so. So and if the good we news, activate- well, I was gonna say with all yeah. of that is it doesn't matter whether you're using sessions or catalogs to do all of this stuff. No, same, um, same, for, same. For recipes, yeah. it's, the same, it's the same set of tools that you have regardless of how you do it. So I think a lot of people look at, because, because the process recipe talks about output location and the output folder and whatever, it feels very session based, but actually it's, it's using the word output literally, as in where do you want it? And it just happens that in exactly. a session you have an output folder. So if I, so on this recipe, TIFF Adobe RGB 1998 8-bit. So I'm gonna put subname full size TIFF, FS TIFF, whatever you wanna call it. So I don't have to change anything here. Uh, this one as the root folder is the output location, it's gonna go here and we can run touch note postcard at the same time, like so. So now if I hit process again, and we go to the session output, we can hit the little arrow. There's my TIFF, it's got FS TIFF at the end of it. You can use a token called format or recipe name as well. It just means your file name kind of gets kind of long. Yeah. Uh, you might not mind that, but I personally can't be doing with enormous file names. And then if we go to touch note postcard and click on the little arrow here, as we had before, Dropbox, touch note, and then postcard in the file name yeah. too. So it just means cool. everything is super automated. Um, the only other option you've got in root folder is image folder, 
which is really handy because that drops the output in the same folder as the image you're as the processing. Image. Yeah. Yeah. And, but so again, if I, I would recommend you have a subfolder if you're going to do that. Yes. And what I do then with the subfolder, I would. So if we make a new recipe, same as original. Uh, excuse the brevity there. So then this would be image folder and then the subfolder I would put as, you know, exports or whatever. Yeah. Or recipe name or I do this export and then I would use do that. Yeah. So if we um, just process out this one shot, uh, so it's going into the image folder, so it's going to ignore everything that's going on here. Uh, sorry, in here. So it's still going to do my output naming. So sub name, yeah. if I wanted to, what is this? Uh, this is going to be a full size TIFF, isn't it? So sub name, I could do SFS TIFF again. So it's going to go in the same folder where this photo belongs and it's going to make a subfolder called exports and use the recipe name as well, which is called same as origin. So if we say process and we go to image folder, oh, it's on the other screen over here so if we scroll down we see exports same as origin and there it is yep like so cool so that's actually a really handy workflow as well yeah. if you want to keep raws and and your finished ones in the same together. yeah in the same folder exactly. so a couple of quick questions before we let david go so uh Yo. dan said if you can search for files so going back to the catalog scenario if you can search mm -hmm. for files by date why put the um, date of the name of the folders mm -hmm. i can tell you why um and frankly it's for file organization um it's to yeah. keep me sane so it's nothing to do with capture one absolutely capture one within that catalog you can just go to the date section and choose based on um the date that the image was shot However, when you're looking at it at a file system level, it just keeps me a little more definitely um, aware of which, yeah. which files were there by which day. So I use it in this different place, having different folders by day, but the two of them can interoperate. So I can search for it by the fault. I can go into the folder by the day, or I can use Capture One's ability just to look for the date that the, the shot yeah. was taken. And of course, if you go to Antelope Canyon five times in your lifetime or whatever, <laughs> I'm sick of it by then. Um, but but then you can't have five folders called yeah. Antelope Canyon. You think, oh, I should probably put the year that I went there, which is what I started yeah. doing. And then I thought, shit, I should have probably put the date as as well. So it's that's, that's why. It, yeah. And there's also the pessimistic view. If um, a huge bomb was dropped on Capture One HQ and yeah. all of us died and Capture One didn't exist anymore. You want some sort of organization, at least. You want some <laughs> kind of very basic organization. Yeah. To, to use on your next application of choice. But let's hope yeah. that doesn't happen. Um, and then next one from Earl. Uh, so I always copy from card to an existing folder on the hard drive, then go to capture one and just sync the folder. Is that okay? So if you're on a session, then yes, <laughs> yep. that's what it will do because it'll automatic. That's exactly what it's designed sync, to you do. Don't have to sync. Um, yep. Yeah, if you're on a catalog, then again, there's nothing. So yes is the answer. So it's what I do. Um, I my will take only, from a card, put into a folder um, and, then, and then import. My only complaint about that is that I think it's slightly inefficient because you're doing mm. a copy, then you're going to capture one and doing a sync. So you're doing two actions. Whereas if you just said, import from card to the folder that you wanted to go to, True. then you've yeah. done it in one action. Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment so, you've got the option in a, in a catalog term, you can say current destination or current location or um, inside the catalog, but you could actually put a destination. Yeah. So if we just open up the catalog, so there's nothing wrong with it, but you're doubling the work essentially. Yeah. So if I was to say import images, I would then um, just, oh, let's choose pull. So imagine this was a memory card or something. Memory like card, in. then rather than I would simply choose the folder yeah. and then, okay, I know these have to go into my uh, pull folder. I'm not going to do it because they already exist, of course. Yeah. So if I chose, where's he gone? There, set as import folder and then say import, I've done everything in one hit. Yeah. And to be honest, if you wanted to add any other stuff going on, like adjustment. Well, yeah, or like your naming whatever, and descriptions. Or and naming stuff in metadata. or you wanted to rename, yeah. then you can do all of that in one yeah. hit. So it's just inefficient to do it that way, yeah. but it still works.
Cool. Uh, and then I'm going to say one. Oh, sorry, one other one um, from Bobby. Can I have a process recipe for all my sessions which output to one folder on my HD? I don't think you can because you'd have to do it in each. You'd have to load each session to do it. I think, wouldn't you? So can I have a process recipe for all my sessions which output? Yeah. So it would be. So I think what Bobby's saying is. You no, know, as in, so you can have it and and do it in each session. But I think the, the question is maybe, can I? have one button to go through all my sessions and put them in to one folder um one fold. i interpret the question bobby maybe you can clarify is that i think he wants to do this method in that whatever session he opens it mm -hmm. always goes to the same folder yeah well, in which case, so in which case, the answer is yes, but yes, with the caveat that you would have to export from each session. You'd have to if go from, into you'd have each to session. Open each session. Yeah. And yeah, export and, uh, to that so, unique folder. But yes. Yeah. So you would cool. change. You would make a session which would be whatever my. Uh, ah, there we go. He's just said. So uh, you just showed it already for the postcards example. So yeah, it yes. it, it is that. So. You'd yeah. have one one particular location that you would always export to, and it just happens that you would have to go into each session to actually do the yeah. uh, do the exports exactly. off. Yeah. Cool. Um, right. Uh, so good news. So thanks for the uh, export info. <laughs> we'll have to play this back very slowly and often. Uh, <laughs> cool. So and, and actually, that's the the reason these things are recorded is that you can you can go back and you can um, you can mute David and I now that you've heard us wittering on. You can probably just follow it through. Or and I th um, think the last session I the last webinar I did on organizing your sessions, the last part was all about exporting as well. So you can cool. also watch that. Yeah, and actually that's that's a point. So all of David's stuff that he does in terms of webinars is on the Capture One portal as well. So go to I think it's learn.captureone.com, isn't it? And then you've got access yeah, to all the webinars. And, yeah. um, or you can else. go so, to Capture One Pro YouTube and find a whole bunch of stuff there. But I think it's called organizing with sessions or optimizing with okay. sessions. I, I can't remember. But the the last part of that is all about various different tokens you use. And the most common tokens are you know the recipe name, the star rating, the color tag the original destination of the the folder uh, or the, at least the name. So in, in my case with my uh, session. So if you remember, this session was organized in such a way it had four of these folders. Mm. So another common uh, popular token is to let's say I exported this picture. Capture One would automatically copy the path. OK, so this picture belongs in March 1st, 2018. So in output, it would recreate March 1st, 2018 and put the file in there. So those four are kind of the most popular tokens in use. Cool. Right. On which basis we will let David go about 45 minutes longer than I said. <laughs> I said it's a bit. It's always the way. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but no, it's good. Um, so the good news is actually, I think from memory, we've answered probably um, every single part of what we said we did would. we do manage to reference i think we did um we yeah the inside catalog versus in its current folder um, yeah yeah so yeah, yeah if, if we're talking about bringing in a catalog um sorry bringing in images into a catalog you've got the choice a referenced catalog is one where you've left the images where they are and you're going to relocate them and so on if you yeah. choose to store your images inside the catalog so when you go to the import box it says inside catalog if you do that, that's great because you can just pick up the catalog in one go and move it around with you wherever you are and all the changes are always with you. However, where it's not so great is if the catalog gets corrupted or if you have a very big catalog, what you're talking about is lumping along with you every single um, file and everything every time you make any changes, which that, that can be a challenge. Cool. Um, so on that note, uh, we're going to get off and probably do an edit quickly um, before we're done at four o'clock. I'm going to let David go. Um, so I'm going to hang cool. up rather abruptly in a minute, but that's good because <laughs> then he can get on with what he wanted to put on his screen rather than uh, catalog and sessions. <laughs> cool. Um, so thank you, David. Uh, Pleasure. We will um, probably see you again at some point, but um, that'll be I'm on something sure. different. We won't rerun this because you guys can rerun this instead. So cool. Exactly. Right. All right. Cheers. So shall I just and hang up then and hopefully that you won't can hang up and I will just um well I'm just going to delete you now off of the screen there you go you're gone you you <laughs> gone. disappeared done <laughs> Bye. right cool all right cheers
Okay, um, so all of you that are still back with me, um, so we are going to go into Capture One. So just a, a quick recap. I can ah, I can remove my earpiece now, which is great. Um, so quick recap. Um, we are using Capture One version 20.1.2, um, which is the same as 13.1.2. And everything you've just seen from David Grover was also on 20.1.2 or 13.1.2, depending on whether you're marketing or coder. Um, so we will do more of those sessions if need be. So if we get a similar thing where a lot of people are coming up with the same sort of theme of questions, we'll try and um, do a session either with me or David or both of us um, if we think that it'll help. Um, and that's the plan. So let's go into Capture One. And we've probably got time for one, maybe two edits, but we'll try for one for sure. Um, and we're going to start with, um, especially based on the fact that a lot of you want black and white stuff, we're going to go into a black and white conversion um, for this one. So this is one of Marco's shots that he sent in. Um, so Fuji um, or Fuji shot, it's loaded in the lens profile. So all the normal stuff, guys. So chromatic aberration, I'm going to click on analyze to make sure it's done it for this particular um, camera on the sensor. We've possibly got, a, I'm not sure whether it is keystoning or whether the posts aren't exactly straight. I know this one's definitely not straight, um, but we'll have a look at those in a second. But there's a, maybe a little bit of, let me just get rid of my proof margin, sorry. Um, maybe a little bit of distortion on the lens. Um, so it's loaded in 100%. If I put this down, we can see whether it was. Yeah, so Capture One believes um, that with this lens profile, it needs a bit of adjustment, which is why it's loaded in a distortion correction. Um, at f13, so not a harmonious um, aperture. However, I don't see too bad, but actually there's a bit of diffraction in there, and diffraction correction sharpened it up a little bit. So if I go into this section here, we're being unfair, we're at 400%. But if I turn diffraction correction off, you can see it's a little softer. Um, the when I click and, and put it back on again. So the lens profile has done a good job of sharpening that up. Um, so that's all good. Um, the sharpness fall off, I'm not too worried about because that diffraction's um, fixed. Light fall off, well, we can bring in a little bit of this. So look at this top part here. We've got a tiny bit of vignetting. Whether it's vignetting or whether it's the atmosphere starting to get deeper blues as we go up, I'm not too sure, but I might dial, sorry, well, wrong button. <laughs> Might dial a little bit of light fall off in, but not too much. Okay, let's go on to the image itself. Um, and obviously we normally start with the histogram um, and our effectively our exposure tab, which is the one with the little histogram on the top. Um, that exposure tab is gonna give us the ability to change things like clarity and structure and so on. But because I know I want to turn this into a black and white shot, and I'll show you why in a, in a bit, I'm gonna start actually with a style. Um, so normally, you know, we've talked about styles before, whether it's right to use styles versus your own style and so on. Sometimes for black and white, some of the styles that are built into, for instance, the beyond styles are a good starting point to just sort of get a sense for where the image can go. Um, because, for example, what I can see here, if I go into our um, black and white or beyond black and white, um, where are we, 200, which is, I like this one, it's a, a nice heavy contrast style. Um, what we'll find is unfortunately we've lost a huge amount of detail in here and it's because in our exposure tab that style has loaded in quite a lot of um, crushing and, and, and changes to the contrast for example so instead of that version i'm going to actually load in maybe let's just have a look we'll go with um, beyond black and white 102. you don't have to start with a style so you can start with with just the, the normal black and white conversion, but I'm just going to start from a style um, just for speed um, in part. But also it's a good way of just looking at what can result from the image if you were to do some tweaks. Because remember, in all of these, we can go through and see what the changes were. That's all they're doing. They're just automating some of the changes. Uh, one question from Claudio. So what do you uh, what do you if a maximum 120 distortion correction, the building object is still distorted? Uh, no, you're not out of luck. We covered that um, in last week. So um, if you need to go further than the 120, which is distortion set at one, I would question it because if the lens profile has loaded in correctly and you're 100 percent distortion, in theory, that's as distortion or as as corrected as it should go. In practice, however, if you want to go further, go to the generic pincushion distortion. And with that, with that one, we can go way further. Um, so that's without, and then we can push it way, 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 way more. 
um, but if it's loaded in the correct profile which this one had then in theory at 100 it is correct um, so I'd, um, I'd, I'd think about whether or not you actually need um, to push it um, any further or whether it just needs a bit of keystone for example so here's our shot um, with a style loaded in but that style remember all it's done is it's preset some of these sliders and one of the other sliders that's preset so it's done the exposure ones but it's done a black and white conversion and it's used these sliders here which control the sensitivity of different color channels for that conversion so in other words if I'm a red tone in the picture at the moment, make me brighter on a scale of you know, plus 100 to minus 100 um, by of two. Sorry, so we'll reset to zero. One thing to be careful of with styles, just, um, I've just done it um, for those of you that didn't uh, notice it. When I reset a tool, it resets to zero, it resets to the baseline. It doesn't reset to the style. The only way of resetting to the style is to either do the undo or to reapply that style. So for example, here, if I don't like this minus 30 on blue, if I double click here, it goes to zero. But the style loaded in at minus 30, or minus 30. So what happens if I changed it to plus 69? I want to get back to what the style had. Well, if I double click, it takes me back to zero. So be careful that your style isn't the reset point. The reset point is always neutral. If you load in a style and you reset a tool, it doesn't reset back to the style. It resets back to the tool's reset point. OK, so with this one, though, let me just turn off the black and white so we can see. So we've got some blues up here and we've got some cyans down here. What that means is I've got the ability with this image, if I really wanted to, to pull down the cyans and the blues and get some real cool contrast in that sky. So remember, I'm not pulling down the brightness of the overall image. I'm pulling down the brightness of the cyan and blue channels before it does the black and white conversion or as part of the process of converting to black and white. So same here. If I turn off our black and white, let's have a look. So these bricks would probably be in the red scale. So if we went up and down, yeah, so we can control those a little bit. Now, in this case, I want to pull the red down a little bit. Now, what about the our yellows? Because the yellows, unfortunately, even though we're pulling them all the way up, they're actually really, really dark to start with. They're not they're not that saturated in there um, as it stands. So in here, we can play with some of these sliders that have absolutely no effect whatsoever because the color isn't in the image. But once I've got my tones correct from there, we can now go into our exposure tab and with our exposure tab, we can now start to play with shadow. So where the black and white conversion changes our way of looking at the image from being color to being contrast, this is great. We've got a huge contrast, but we've probably got too much contrast in this shadow here, in my view. So what we can do is we can just pull up our shadows or our blacks. And the reason that this has gone a lot darker is our black slider in isolation. And look at that reset. It's gone back to zero, but the black slider was pulled down. So if I use my pointer up here and I look at these little numbers along the top of the screen, it's telling me what value that is. But more importantly, if I look on the left hand side over at the histogram, as I move around the screen, that orange bar is telling me where on the histogram it sits. So these areas down here are in the very, very, very bottom part of the histogram. They're not just in shadows. So shadows would be, say, here. So this dark gray area here, that's in the shadows. If I affect the shadow area, so from 32, let's make that brighter, darker. I'm affecting lots of stuff, including the very darkest bits, but I'm affecting things that I don't want to include. Whereas blacks, as I move my mouse around, that's only in this section here. Once I'm here, I'm way out of the black area. Look at the histogram, we're in the midtones. Here is in the black area, here is in the black area. So I know that my black slider if I pull that up, I'm only affecting those darkest parts of the image, not the whole image, not the sky that was sat in the shadows. So with our black, I can just pull it up a bit. I still need contrast. Remember, with black and white, we're using contrast to be able to see what's going on. But I don't want so much contrast that I'm actually losing all the detail in the brickwork. The, the detail is really, really cool. Now on that, Remember, we've got the difference between clarity and structure. So let's just uh, do it maximum so you can see what's going on. So maximum clarity. What is clarity doing? It's taking areas and it's saying, right, look at your neighbor. And based on where the boundary is, so where that line is, 
are you darker or lighter than your neighbor and if you're darker make yourself darker still if you're lighter make yourself lighter still positive it increases contrast or, or dynamic contrast in the midtone specifically negative you end up with these massive halos here and this can be a problem because this is how i can see that you've used too much clarity um david did a session a live session uh, i think it was last week and one of the questions that came in from someone was how do i get rid of the halo well how do you get rid of the halo you don't introduce the halo because actually it wasn't there in the raw it was introduced through clarity so if i pull our clarity down we lose this halo so where did the halo come from well it came from the fact that this area here is said to capture one well i'm darker than this cloud so i should make myself darker still and then at a certain point it runs out of that and it says well okay actually i'm now next to my neighbor um who's darker again so now i'm going to have to get lighter um so it gets a bit confusing as you, as you start to walk away from high contrast points but let's leave clarity alone because structure is our friend in this shot too much structure and you end up with this horrible stuff um, looks a little bit overdone too it's over sharp it's, it's painful to look at but if i pull up a little bit of structure so maybe up to 20 or 30 uh, again i'm being unfair we're going to go at 200 percent but let's look at the difference with before that's before and after you see everything crisps up so whenever you see anything with good texture and edges and lines and all that stuff structure is your friend that's what's going to enhance the look of the image but be careful that iso oh, sorry high iso so noise is also something that structure will pick up um i'm going to be potentially a little bit controversial because it depends on how you look at this stuff but i'm going to delete this cloud over here so i'm going to create a new healing layer new band-aid um, little icon up here i don't have a healing layer already so as i start to draw it's going to create a heal layer on the left hand side and capture one's guessed it correctly which is good and what i'm going to do is i'm going to change our crop not to output like what we just discussed with david i'm going to change it to a square crop because i think actually this one suits a square we've got a debate here whether you leave that in the little rock this shadow here i don't think is necessary actually to the image um so i'm sort of in a place where we could probably push to there and that gives us a really nice red shot um so again nothing wrong uh, let's create a new variant of it so this is the original shot the color version is equally nice it, it's it's actually a quite a flat image if you look at it in theory but in practice when you get into some of the details here it can be quite nice let's create a new um, adjustment layer with a little gradient on it and i'm going to affect this area up here one uh, a couple of little tweaks finally before we go so i'm going to i am going to push a little bit of clarity but only in the sky and i'm going to increase our contrast just a touch as well and i might actually pull our exposure down just to get a bit more definition in that sky a um, bit more strength in it if we wanted to fix these poles and i say fix very carefully because they might not be wrong um, but if i loaded in our, our keystone tool which is the two um, vertical bars up here we can also do a horizontal of course and just move them along so i'm just trying to drive them parallel to that and parallel to that apply okay maybe it's worth doing uh, maybe that's a bit better um, we are going to have an issue with our cloud up here so we might want to switch from square to be three by four another standard size um, but if we do that oops got a bit over overzealous with, with the mouse we've now got a decision to make about where the image finishes because we've now got to consider whether we leave this shadow in or not mm, i don't know um but to me that feels relatively finished it's a nice frame um we're, we're right in terms of composition and it, it just feels a bit more dramatic than the color version okay so bad news for this thursday we've edited one photo and that's probably going to be the last photo that we edit in this session but hopefully you got some benefit and huge benefit of having david in as well and um, to talk about the catalogs and session stuff the the raw answer um excuse the pun is there is no right answer for whether or not sessions or catalogs are better for you there are some that will feel better because of the way that you work and you shoot or the volume of images you've got or the way that you go out and come back or you need to synchronize or if you work in a studio all that stuff they're, they're all factors as to what the right decision is but 
whatever you choose, whether it's catalogs or sessions, just get to know the tools that are available to you really well. So if you want to use catalogs, learn catalogs really well. Learn the way the filters that you can use, the smart albums you can set up and all that stuff that's built into catalogs. If you're going to stick with sessions, then learn some of the processing stuff that happens when you bring things into the session. So putting tokens on the file names and so on can really help organize stuff. So in general terms, there isn't a right answer, but hopefully today, hopefully, um, that's answered most of your questions that you had um, and uh, some of the other stuff besides. Um, right, so that's it for today. Um, sorry, boys and girls. Um, we will catch you next week um, on the next session. So same time as normal next week. It'll be three o'clock on Thursday, uh, UK time. In the meantime, you are welcome to join in on to that for our Facebook group. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a, there's a big thing on printing at the moment in there about whether or not you want to buy a printer. Um, so as a general rule, general answer to that question, because I haven't replied to it. Buying a printer is an investment, not just in the initial investment. It's going to cost you money keeping it going. You need to make the decision as to whether or not you print enough to warrant doing that. Um, but there we go. So um, there's a the Facebook group. Join in uh, as you so choose. Um, remember as well, there's also those YouTube pro tips videos. Um, so things like clarity and structure and stuff that we covered very briefly in this um, of course, you can load up the 20 minute um, tutorials that we put up there um, that will go into a lot more depth. Remember to send in your files ready for next week. So next week is Thursday at 3 p.m. London time. So back to a normal time. Send in your files before then. Um, raw files, please, not JPEGs. Um, and we'll edit what we can. Um, we won't have David to distract us next time. So it's all good. Um, we'll do a lot more editing. There we go. And in the meantime, um, stay safe, everyone. I know things are changing quite rapidly out there. So good luck with wherever you are. Um, um, and we will catch you next week and send us a message if you need anything in the meantime. Cheers. Bye.